Hi everybody, it's I Read Canadian Day. So welcome to Earl of March Library's celebration of all things Canadian writing. We have a wonderful array of authors with us today. I am so excited by the amount of talent we have in the room or in the virtual room, I should say. So I'm going to show you, give you a little introduction to our authors and then I'm going to turn the meeting over to our moderator, Mr. Crilly. So our authors today are Sarah Raleigh, Primi Muhammad, Lex Beckett, Jen Braxma, and of course, Brandon Crilly. And we do want to just say thank you so much to our panelists. They are all volunteering their time and their talent to share with, with us today to celebrate Canadian writing. So our moderator, of course, you will recognize is Mr. Crilly. So our own Mr. Crilly is a teacher by day, but he is an Aurora Award nominated podcaster, reviewer, conference programmer and author in his alter ego. And his most recent publication is True Balance, which is published in Flip Volume 2, which we will soon have in our library. Our first author is Sarah Raleigh, and you may recognize this name because we do have Fate of Flames in the library, and we have Siege of Shadows, Legacy of Light on order, and Bones of Rune also on order, although that's not going to be out until September. Lex Beckett is a queer science fiction author, editor, and poet who lives in Toronto, Ontario, and their first novella, Freezing Rain, A Chance of Falling, was a 2019 finalist for the Theodore A. Sturgeon Memorial Award. Their new novel, Deal Breaker, which we have just ordered, is the sequel to Game Changer, which we have also just ordered, and I had a chance to take a look at them, and they look very exciting. Premi Mohammed is an Indo-Caribbean scientist and speculative fiction author based in Edmonton, Alberta. Her short fiction has appeared in a variety of venues. Her debut YA novel is Beneath the Rising, which she's going to show us today. And the sequel, A Broken Darkness, is coming out in a matter of days. And we, all, we have all of these on order. And last but definitely not least, we have our own very own Ms. Braxma. Um, now, you know her as a teacher, but maybe you didn't know that she's a writer and a book coach as well. And if you've taken a look at her wrist, it has the word passion tattooed on it. And her passion is writing and reading and teaching. And her YA novel, Evangeline's Heaven, will be published in fall 2021. So congratulations, Ms. Braxma. So those are our wonderful panelists. I am going to turn this session over to our moderator, Mr. Crilly. Take it away, Mr. Crilly. Uh, thanks, Laura. And again, thanks uh, to our four authors for uh, for joining us today for this, which is so incredibly cool. Um, so for those of you that don't know me, either at Earl of March or out there in the vastness of the internet, whoever is watching this. Um, so I'm Brandon Crilly, uh, or Mr. Crilly to my students. Um, I uh, teach history and English here at Earl of March, um, and uh, I'm a writer of science fiction and fantasy, uh, you know, short fiction and comics and gaming and, and whatnot, and do programming for CanCon and like a bazillion other things that keep me tired and busy constantly. Um, and yeah, and I'm going to be your, your moderator today. So um, how this is going to work is for uh, each of our four authors, um, they're going to do a little bit of reading from uh, some of their latest work. Um, I'm going to throw a couple of uh, specific questions uh, at them about their work. Um, and then we'll have some general questions with the whole group about uh, Canadian fiction and you know, what it means to be reading Canadian, because uh, that's our whole theme here today. Um, I'm just going to ask everybody to introduce themselves uh, first, um, you know, give a little bit of background about uh, who they are and what they do. Um, and so I'll just kind of go in the order of uh, who I can see on the screen. So I will start with Lex. Uh, hi, um, I am Lex Beckett. I am a science fiction and fantasy writer. I live in Toronto. Um, before that until about 2013 I lived in uh, British Columbia so I've I've covered a a swath of Canada um, and sometimes I dream about living in every region but no probably not um, I teach creative writing um, at UTSC and also through online classes at UCLA and uh, I also write fantasy novels under the name A.M. Delamonica um, I'm non-binary and my pronouns are they them Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I should have mentioned as well that my pronouns are he, him. I, 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 sorry, let that in. Um, thank you very much, Lex. Um, I'll go to Premi next. Oh, hi. Um, yeah, I'm Premi Mohammed. I'm a uh, sci-fi, fantasy, horror, 
weird, etc. author uh, based out of Edmonton, Canada, and I uh, have also lived in Calgary and Saskatoon, so I've lived in a very small region <laughs> of Canada, and um, my regular job is as a government scientist for the government of Alberta, and uh, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm super excited to be here. Thanks. Uh, Jen? Hi, I'm a teacher at Earl of March. I'm a book coach as well, and I'm also a writer, uh, mostly young adults, young adults, uh, fantasy, as well as uh, mystery. I'm also working on literary fantasy for adults. Uh, so I get the best of both worlds, teaching students, working with writers uh, through my book coach business privately, and also getting to share the experience with readers. Awesome. And Sarah? Hi, I'm Sarah Raleigh, uh, the author of the FG series, Young Adult Fantasy, and the upcoming uh, Bones of Ruin. And um, I'm a, a, a graduate of McMaster University, so I live in uh, Hamilton, Ontario. I have a PhD in English, and I also do a lot of freelance writing on top of being an academic. So I've written for Teen Vogue and the Washington Post, and uh, just very happy to be here. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Um, so we're going to start with uh, Lex for our uh, our reading and, and specific questions. So I'm going to turn it over to them uh, to uh, read from their work. I'll go ahead and mute myself. Great. Um, this is my brand new book. It's called Deal Breaker. I'm, I'm trying to get it. <laughs> this tiny Zoom window makes it hard to be sure, but I'm pretty sure it's in the center of the frame. Uh, this is the sequel to my... 2019 book Game Changer, but um, takes place, you know, about 20 years later, and and I hope it stands by itself. Uh, but I decided to read just a little bit of the opening, which uh, ironically is a futuristic Zoom meeting, basically. Um, so I wrote this before the pandemic started, but uh, it the social stuff in this book has become weirdly, increasingly relevant, and um, I'll show you what. What I imagine we're going to bring of all of what we're having now. Chapter one. VRTB, housebook.earth, backslash family homes, slash user, feral5, HMS surprise.vr, February 14th, 2121. The event the feral5 called their superversary was a surprise party, meaning that everyone was cosplaying Royal British Navy personnel and the simulated ship they were aboard was literally the HMS Surprise. Looking around, Frankie Barn could hard, Barnes could hardly see a meter of deck where she and Maud hadn't had sex. The anniversary party was an intimate affair, 30 or so of the packs collected in-laws and a selection of close friends. Their pack mate, Germain, was up near the wheel, addressing their guests. He wasn't overly keen on the original master and commander fandom, and so he had dressed as a Chinese fleet admiral from the 2079 reboot of the franchise. German speech covered all the things you usually heard at such events. Warm words about Maud and Frankie falling into a big-time, full-on hearts and flowers romance, about Maud making an enormous leap of faith by becoming Frankie's primary and marrying into their unorthodox family bubble. None of the feral four knew we were incomplete, not really, not until she joined us. All true, and the crowd was lapping it up. Maud herself was turned out in the ragged naturalist gear of the surprise doctor, complete with red tinted hair and sideburns. The first time she had seen this particular cosplay, Frankie had found the look compellingly sexy and thoroughly odd. Maud was about as far from a natural redhead as it got. She could have stepped right out of a historical sim set in the East Euro steppes, one of those wildly popular pony racing sims about the Mongol Derby, maybe, with her jet hair, sturdy limbs, and round face. As usual, she was visibly ill at ease about being the center of attention. Frankie was about to beeline for her beloved when their other packmates fell into step on either side of her. Ember Kaderi's tune wore the half-starved body and the robes of a prison, Persian prisoner of war, also from MC 2079. As Frankie took this in, he attempted a clumsy, loose-limbed pirouette. You couldn't chill out about the old British Empire for one afternoon, Frankie subbed. Colonization's a freshly relevant issue in this day and age, Ember said airily. Besides, I had to balance out Babs. Fair, Frankie signed. Their feral fifth had wrapped her base avatar, a tortoiseshell cat, 
in full dress uniform as Admiral Nelson or some cartoon femme version thereof. As Germaine's speech built to its big finish, the three of them slid between the assembled cart partygoers, closing on Maud. Everyone raised their glasses and followed Germ in a very royal round of shouting, Huzzah! Frankie offered an arm, and Maud eased into, into her embrace, fitting snugly against her, two spaceships docking. Ember blew her emoji kiss, while Babs generated a purr that went down into the deck and came up as a vibration underfoot. Contentment, a bit of a rarity of that, suffused Frankie. This had been a good idea. Uh, and that's about three minutes, so maybe I'll leave her there. That's awesome. Um... Uh, the, the the image of, of Nelson as a cat, I think, is just like, <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Um, thing, and I'm used to, like, at, at, like, live reading series having applause and stuff. It still feels weird not to be applauding after a reading. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Thank you. No worries. Um, okay, so a couple of questions. Implied. Sorry, what's that? Applause is implied. Of course. <laughs> um, okay, so a couple of questions for you, Lex. Um, mm. So uh, one of the, the elements that um, is obviously in in, uh, in Deal Breaker and, and um, an element of Game Changer as well is uh, colonialism, which then comes up in, in a lot of our fiction here in Canada. And so I'm, I'm curious if any of Canada's kind of complicated history, to put it mildly, um, with colonialism um, informed any of your world building, any of your uh, development of these books. Yeah, it, it absolutely did. I'm, I've spent a lot of my career sort of writing about varying forms of cultural predation. And, and one of the themes that sort of arises in my science fiction over and over is the idea that if advanced aliens with all the fancy technologies were to sort of show up and want to take us over, the people who would probably be most effectively able to resist those colonization efforts would be the people who've been living under and fighting under colonization for centuries mm -hmm. already. So, you know, the indigenous people in places like North America and Australia, the people of the Indian subcontinent, everyone in Africa. Um, in this particular universe, North America has had much of its landmass or much of its population sort of condensed into megacities as mm -hmm. part of the effort to roll back climate change. Um, but indigenous communities have special privileges and more rights to live outside those cities. Uh, so it's not true reconciliation as we sometimes try to imagine it now in Canada as we sort of grope towards that, but it's sort of mm -hmm. an effort towards reconciliation that got a bit swamped by climate change, but not ignored by it. Um, and so we only really see little glimpses of how that works, like the Messi Mohawk Casino Consortium is one of the sort of most powerful innovators in Deal Breaker or sorry, in Game Changer. And um, in Deal Breaker, there's a character whose parents are Laplanders. So she gets to live in an outlier community in Finland if she wants, because there's land sort of mm. not set aside for them. I really sort of grappled with that, like how you allow those exceptions without sort of rebuilding the reservation system. Yeah. Um, but um, as you also heard in, in that opening chapter, there's also been like efforts to do things like decolonize fandom. So like, there's nothing more whitey britty than master and commander. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and there are so many people who love that franchise, but there isn't necessarily it isn't necessarily open to every person who wants to imagine themselves into it now. But but one of the things I think fandom is really great about is is looking for those opportunities to widen the things we love that are currently problematic. Um, mm -hmm. So I wanted to sort of indicate that that both that that would continue and that it's important. Mm -hmm. That's neat. Um, you and I, we, we've talked before at, at other events about like optimism and forward thinking and, and that sort of thing. And, and I kind of, I, I got hints of that in, in what you were just describing. Um, so, but I'm wondering, given you know, everything that you know has gone on in the last year or so, um, has your outlook and, and your optimism towards our future changed at all since like prior to March, 2020? <laughs> I was I was just finishing the first draft of Game Changer at the end of 2016, okay. and and I had I had had an amazing year like my eco fantasy trilogy had wrapped I'd won an Aurora Award I'd started teaching at U of T, and then the U.S. presidential election happened and here I was writing this this optimistic book about our climate change future in the midst of my entire community just kind of diving into a sense of despair and and it was really hard work, um, so I I sort of had to double down on on things I already believed. And that, that core belief is that we can't build a better future if nobody can imagine a better future. Um, like one of the things that stories give us is the opportunity to test drive 
better outcomes for you know future generations. Um, and I, I do believe that if we only create fictional dystopias, then the engineers and sociologists and politicians of upcoming generations are basically hardwired to move in the direction of dystopia. So mm. this has been a really terrible year and, uh, and optimism has often been kind of a moral effort on my part, but, but I think it's also a year where it's pushed a lot of people in a direction where we're talking about ways to possibly change the future and ways to, you know, work internationally to make things better. Um, and so my, my hope is that those conversations will lead us to some good places mm -hmm. um, that out of this will come good things as well as the many terrible things that have also <laughs> occurred. Yeah. Um, so. yeah. mm -hmm. no, that's, all, that's awesome. Yeah, I like to think the same thing. Perfect. Thank you for that, uh, for the reading and for answering the questions. Um, we're going to jump to our, our next person, um, which will be Sarah in our, in our lineup. So uh, yeah, I'll turn it over to you for a little bit of reading and I'll have some questions for you. Sure, thanks. Um, so I'm going to read from my upcoming book called The Bones of Ruin. And the cover's out. I just had my cover reveal uh, last Tuesday. And uh, I love the art. So check it out. Uh, it's coming September 7th. And it's basically about an African tightrope walker who can't die, who gets sort of involved in this secret society's deadly tournament. And it's set in 19th century London, which, you know, I've always been interested in that time period, but I found that there's just a lack of diversity oftentimes in, uh, in books set in Victorian, in the Victorian era of Europe, England. So if you're a fan of like the Gilded Wolves or The Last Magician, hopefully this will be right up your alley. So I'm going to read a little bit uh, from chapter one. The day Iris arrived at Cooley's doorstep was the first day of her life that she remembered. Everything that may have happened the weeks and months and years before was under lock and key somewhere deep in her mind, an unsettling condition when temporarily eased only when she was flying free in the sky. When she first began working at Cooley's company, most of the other workers at the circus had believed her to be around 17 or 18 years. And slowly as the decade passed, many of them began to wonder why her youthful face had not aged a day. She had wondered the same thing. She still wondered, though she tried not to. It hurt to ask questions with not even a hint as to the answer. Sometimes during those lonely nights, it hurt more than death, and she knew death. It's the way a lot of them are, those Africans, she heard a juggler say one day as they were cleaning out the buckets for the caged tigers. They don't age quickly, I swear it. I've heard Granny Marlowe's hair didn't start turning gray until she crossed 60. It was a good enough explanation for now, Though another decade or so, and it'd be rather difficult to hide her unaging body, even in a place known to revel in oddities. Iris knew her time was running out. The anxiety of when it would end often prickled her skin. Hmm, you've gotten rather heavy, Jane casually noted as he held his position underneath her. Iris pried her eyes apart for the glare that she aimed at him. How dare you, she snipped. Really, though, this is harder than it should be. Quiet, you crank, though the corner of her lips turned upward. With a push, he bent back and let her drop to the rope behind her. The crowd erupted, an expert routine from only the best. Humph, still speaking like uh, as arrogantly as a real royal, Jin said as they both waved to their adoring spectators. And who says I'm not one, she returned with a little smile. A short-lived smile, for her eyes had just caught a curious sight down below. A young man stood apart from the rest of the crowd, watching. His black tweed sack coat was open just enough for her to see his vest and his gray shirt, well-cut trousers, and pristine shoes. Outwardly, he looked like any other wide-eyed, handsome young English gentleman, worthy of the attention he drew from the women walking past him. Clean and proper, except for his hair, a black bloody war zone upon his head. Perhaps that was what those ladies had been staring at. But something within Iris stirred, as it always did when something did not feel quite right. A kind of buzzing underneath her skin, like her nerves were on fire. 
like they'd been plucked and cut too many times. The hazy image of a face shrouded in darkness arose in her mind's eye. A memory? Before the day she met Cooley, Iris didn't have any, none. Even now, she didn't know why. But what she did have was a sense, a sense that she needed to hide herself from something, from the world, perhaps, and also a sense that there was a task she needed to complete, a task so important it was burned into the marrow of her bones. There was a reason she existed. She just couldn't remember what it was. I'll leave it there because I think it's uh, well past two or three minutes. So thank you. <laughs> That's a good stopping point too. That was awesome. Nice. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, I realize my, my first question is, is is one of those like big let's you know speak on behalf of the entire genre sort of questions, but I'm throwing it at you anyway. Um, so you know, we talk a lot about how like you know how Canadian fiction stands out from uh, specifically U.S. fiction, which we're going to come to as a whole group um, at the end. But um, in what ways do you think Canadian YA stands out, um, or does it? Does it like does it kind of get melded in with U.S. Well, I think it depends on, uh, you know, a lot of Canadian YA authors are still trying to get published through the American industry. Mm. And sometimes that means that there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of restrictions involved. It depends on your publisher, depends on your editor, agent, et cetera. Um, I know that there are times when I've tried to publish books um, within the setting of Canada, uh, Toronto, you know, Northern Ontario, things like that. And um, I've been told like, oh, it's, it's kind of a tough sell, mm -hmm. especially if you're trying to publish globally. And again, I think that just depends like on uh, what certain editors might think. I know a lot of foreign editors might look at a book published in Canada and they might sort of shy away from that, or they might look towards books that are, are published in America as more universal um, <laughs> globally. So, you know, I, I try not to think too much about the differences because I think it's really a case by case basis. In terms of um, the Canadian publishing industry, I know that one thing, one of the strengths of the Canadian publishing industry is the granting system. Mm -hmm. um, just in terms of, uh, you know, the amount of grants given to um, to people, to Canadian authors, marginalized authors. Mm -hmm. um, and that often means that small presses in Canada can afford to take some more risks um, compared to U.S. publishers. And I was just involved in, in the granting process. You know, there's the Ontario Council, Council of Arts, the Toronto Council of Arts, and, mm -hmm. and so on. Um, but I think that the setback with that is the Canadian market, you know, is backed by grants and um, there's always like, I don't want to say a quota, but they're very mindful of trying to um, give small presses that ability to take risks and give grants to marginalized authors. But then there's an entire sort of system within Canada once the book is out there, that often doesn't really um, promote and market those books, right? So who is invited to these kinds of talks, these festivals, which books are involved in the libraries or, or included in the lists, um, which books, which authors are invited to the conferences, and so on and so forth. There's not there needs to be, I think, more of a structural change. So it's not just about, you know, giving marginalized Canadian authors all of these grants, but it's about giving them a structure and an apparatus that will allow them to be known and allow their books to be known. So I always kind of think about, you know, whenever we inevitably come to this question of how are we different than America? I always feel like can Canadians are always trying to define themselves, you know, in relation to America. Mm -hmm. Like we can only understand who we are if, if we understand what, America is or is not. And I think that we need to sort of concentrate on what's happening in our own country, in our own systems, um, and sort of look at the history and look at the, you know, the apparatus as it is and what still needs to be changed and fixed in order to create something that really promotes marginalized voices and promotes the, um, 
the professionalization of authors within marginalized communities in Canada. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I want to ask you a specific question about um, uh, the Bones of Ruin. Um, as you mentioned in your description for it, there's this um, kind of world-ending element to it, um, uh, like with Lex's work. Um, but in this case, it's set in the past, which I find really interesting. Um, did you in any way like consciously try to draw parallels with um, like our concerns today about you know potential world ending stuff um, with your focus on the, the 19th century? It reminds me about what Lex said uh, about how she kind of came up with that idea before all of this uh, world ending stuff came into play. And that's very much uh, my situation as well, where I actually came up with the idea of the Bones of Ruin, um, I think sometime in like 2018, 2018 around. And so it wasn't really something that I was thinking about in relation to what was happening today because we were a few years out from COVID and, mm -hmm. and things like that, although we were still in the Trump era, but, um, for me, what I wanted to do is, first of all, I wanted to have a really kick-ass story, right? And uh, the apocalypse always adds certain elements to that, uh, you know, raises the stakes. Mm -hmm. But also, um, I wanted the Bones, and I want the Bones of Ruin to be a commentary on today's concerns as it relates to the, the past and how the past has led to the present, mm -hmm. right? We don't have to be in the COVID era to know that there are a lot of systems that are broken in society. Mm -hmm. Marginalized peoples are going through it, right? And, we, mm -hmm. and it, Black Lives Matter has been a thing before the death of George Floyd, before mm -hmm. um, last year's sort of eruption of the movement in the summer, um, all kinds of things. And so, when I look at books set in the Victorian era, I think what I often see is sort of a skirting around, and not just books, but movies and things like that, like an old, the Enola Holmes movie that just came out and so on. It's kind of like a skirting around the ideas of empire, the, the realities of empire, and the ways in which imperial nation building and, and colonialism in many ways right, has led to some, a lot of the issues that we have today. I mean, you can think about climate change and take it all the way back to the Victorian era and the Industrial mm -hmm. Revolution and things like that. So, you know, it is very much sort of looking to the past and dissecting sort of those power relations and what was happening in the past to comment um, on today and, and what we're Sort of struggling with today though not necessarily the pandemic but just a lot of the things that we have been struggling with mm -hmm. and hopefully people will see those connections that i'm making um in the book mm -hmm. that's awesome no I, I love that um thank you yeah for for describing that and, and for reading that was great you're welcome uh, mm -hmm. all right i'm gonna flip over to uh to jen uh so we'll hear a little bit uh, from your work and then I'll have a couple of questions for you as well Thank you. All right. Well, I'm going to read from my upcoming novel, uh, YA Fantasy, Evangeline's Heaven. It's not coming out until 2022. So it seems like everything else in this world is going at hyperspeed, except for the publishing industry. <laughs> Uh, but that's okay. You know, patience, perseverance, right? Those are the key words for a writer's life. Uh, so uh, this story is set in the heavens when Lucifer rebels against God. Evangeline is his 18-year-old daughter, and she has a crisis of faith when she starts to learn just how far her father will go to claim power. So the fates of the heavens rest on her shoulders, wings. And she must decide for herself whether she's going to be her father's daughter or her own person. So what I'm going to read from is the first part of the first chapter where her father has taken great risks to come and see Evangeline on her birthday. But there's threats that the enemy, the Archangel Gabriel, uh, is, going to, is going to hunt Lucifer down. So she and her father have just met. Uh, so he's taken the risk, and then he's, uh, they've had this nice visit, and then he's about to leave. Evangeline watches her father fly along the rocky coastline, sharp with rugged beauty, as he rises higher into the clouds. Without warning, four figures shoot up from the cliff's edge and surround her father. 
Evangeline sees the silhouette of their swords, recognizes the distinctive white of Gabriel's wings among the attackers, and her heart stops. No, she cries, but the wind and the surf eat up the sound. She unsheathes her sword and leaps into the air. The archangels encircle her father. She hears the quick staccato clang of metal on metal as Lucifer deftly, skillfully fights them off. She sees one of them spiral backward through the air and plummet to the ground with an agonizing scream. The other three close in on Lucifer, their attention so focused on Lucifer's dizzying blade that they don't see Evangeline when she dives into the fray, stabbing one of them in the back above the wings. She hears the crunch of bone and her stomach convulses as she pulls out her sword. For all her skill at sword fighting, she's never had to use it in battle, never had to actually injure someone. It makes her sick. The second archangel spins out of control toward the rocks below. Evangeline, go, Lucifer bellows at her. But shaky or not, Evangeline won't leave her father, not when he's fighting Gabriel, and the third archangel turns to face her, Michael. Evangeline hesitates a moment too long at seeing her one-time friend, the only friend she made at school, although she knew he was kind to her only because his father Gabriel had made him. Michael thrusts his sword at her, cutting into her shoulder. She cries out at the pain, then bites her tongue. The wound burns hot. She feels blood seep onto her skin, but it's not deep. With effort, she refocuses as Michael jabs again. Evangeline parries and attacks. She looks into his silver gray eyes. She sees recognition and she can't think. She blocks his cross swipe and with a swift flick of her wrist, she twists his sword away from her. She's desperate to know how her father is doing against Gabriel. They are well matched. The master Gabriel having trained his then protege Lucifer exceedingly well. The Gabriel is older and Lucifer fights with a passion unequaled in all the heavens. So Evangeline is hopeful, but still, she can't afford to look. Michael abruptly flies to her left, but Evangeline immediately spins to meet his blade. The wind picks up, pushing them past the cliff's edge, out over the rocks, frothing with waves. No, she hears her father's roar. With a gut-wrenching fear, her head snaps toward him as he wrings the tips of Gabriel's snowy wings. Gabriel drops in the air, but he's able to control his descent, injured, as Lucifer launches upward. Michael, Gabriel cries. Michael rockets after Lucifer, but Evangeline hurls herself at him. She grasps a handful of silver feathers and yanks him back with all her might. They grapple in the air as Michael tries to shake her off, but Evangeline's weight drags them both down. Out of control, they both spiral down, down, down. Michael tries to kick at her, and Evangeline's grip slips, but she holds on. She has to. She has to make sure her father gets away. I'll leave you in for suspense until 2022. <laughs> but Jen, that's so long to wait. <laughs> no, that was great. Thanks. Um, first question I want to throw at you is, is the, the same first one that I, I gave to uh, to Sarah about uh, Canadian YA. So um, you, from your perspective, um, how does uh, Canadian YA stand apart from, you know, American YA? Um, does it, and, and I'll throw in there at the end, should it, based on uh, some of what, uh, what Sarah was saying? Yeah, and... Uh... I think that I'll take this from a slightly different direction, also as a teacher of adults in, in the high school system, uh, especially when I'm looking at what books I want to teach my students, what books to talk about, what books to recommend. And overall, you're, you're right, you can't overgeneralize um, because there's so many great YA that were written uh, by American authors set in the US and obviously in Canada here too. Uh, but when we look at the cultural context of it, so a book like The Hate You Give, which I love and we use in our classes and it's fantastic and there's so much there, is a story that is universal even though it's set in the States. Uh, but the students can also appreciate and learn about the specific context of the story set mm. in the States. But then when we look at Indigenous literature here in Canada that has a focus, so a YA book like The Marrow Thieves, it's, it's YA, it's dystopian, it's not, um, you know, officially set in, uh, you know, a specific Toronto that we can all recognize and see, but it's meant to represent the land that we're here. And even though it's not specifically quote unquote Canada, it's from an Indigenous perspective, I think that we can still learn a lot from a, a story written by a Canadian Indigenous author about more of our own history. So mm -hmm. Don't, I don't want to sound like there aren't benefits to reading. I mean, it's, it's that mirrors versus windows, right? We need both. We need windows to better understand people 
unlike us who don't look or who haven't had the same experiences as us, but it's also important uh, that we see experiences that are set in this same area that, that we live in, even from an indigenous perspective when it's different um, than you know my white settler experience, for example. So benefit for both, should there be a difference? Yeah, I, I think that there should be because there is. It's a matter of just being able to appreciate that there's value in both. Awesome. Yeah. Um, speaking of teaching, um, how I, I initially phrased this as how useful is it uh, being a teacher, um, you know, when it comes to writing YA, which I imagine it is. Um, and so I'm curious whether you, whether or how much you use um, inspiration from like our teaching life um, for your YA, or do you, or do you, do you deliberately try to keep those two worlds like totally separate in terms of the inspiration that you draw? Yeah, I, I can't keep them separate. It's, okay. it's that, all yeah. parcel of, of who I am. I mean, there's a reason I teach high school and not like elementary school, for example. I love I love our, our audience, the students, the age that they're at. I have two teenagers myself now too, so it's a great age. Um, because I love their passion and I love their idealism. I'm not saying all students are passionate and idealistic about the same thing. Some of but, but Teens, and I get, I get it, I overgeneralize, but, but teens feel so strongly. They either really, really love something or they really, really hate something. Mm -hmm. And a passion that I love to read in YA as well, and it's, and it's those characters as they're trying to figure out the world that they're inheriting and what they're going to get going forward. Uh, so absolutely, the, the intensity of the experience of being a young person is what I'm drawn to in my day job as a teacher, but also what I love about the characters that I can create and the characters that I love to read in YA. And uh, how much of my students go into my stories? Well, um, maybe I won't get into any games. <laughs> Um, but no, you know, like every student is such an individual, just as my characters are, but there's a lot like, you know, I can create compasses. And honestly, the first novel that I wrote, uh, which is still in the drawer, maybe someday I'll revise it and, and put it back out there. Uh, it's a, it's a murder mystery on a retelling of Macbeth. It's a great story. I love it, you know, because the student council president is Duncan King, you know, you get it. Um, and and that was in my heyday when I had so many courses where I was teaching Macbeth. I was taking what I was doing, what I was comfortable with, looking at my students, how they were reacting to the story, and then putting it together in a completely different context. But it was it was very much focused, you know, very much set in a contemporary high school, just like what I experienced. And that gave me such a great grounding to, to um to branch off from there, to dive into other types of worlds, like the fantasy world that I was just reading about. So yeah, teaching, writing, dealing with young people, teens and young adults, um, it's its all combined. And yeah, that's where my passion is. Awesome. Love it. Uh, thank you. Um, so I'm going to go to uh, to Premi, last but certainly not least. Um, <laughs> and so yeah, I'll uh, turn it over to you for uh, your reading. And then yeah, I'll have a couple questions for you as well. Awesome. Thank you, Brandon. Um, so yeah, this is from my, uh, my debut novel, which came out last year, Beneath the Rising, uh, which is about a child prodigy who, uh, as, as we say, uh, invents a way to uh, give the world clean energy and uh, also in the process invents a bunch of problems. Uh, and it's funny you should mention uh, publishing a trunked novel because this was written when I was in my first undergrad. And uh, so I was about 18. I was a peer with the people in the book and then I just kind of trunked it and sat on it. <laughs> so, uh, this is the scene in uh, early on where the narrator, Nick, has been called to come over to his best friend's place and she sounds a little weird. So maybe there's something going on over there. Mm. Uh, what's going on? Every single light was on, even some I hadn't known existed, tucked away in recesses in the ceiling, behind floor vents, in sunk tracks on the walls. The heat was intense after the coolness of the evening, sweat prickled on my back. Great. Stupid to believe I couldn't possibly smell any worse. Moisture was condensing under my socks on the cool tiles. She appeared at the end of the hallway, and for a second I thought she'd figured out how to make herself into a hologram all... Silver spangles shimmering and shivering, not really there. I hesitated before following her. Uh, sorry, I said. I thought maybe you were a T-1000? 
That's the last goal of science, not the first, she said. But no one will want to be a robot after I show the world what just happened. I looked at her properly and did a cartoony double take, making her giggle. She was in a short white dress, covered in silver sequins. On anyone taller, it would have been practically a shirt. What the heck is this? I said. Like, no offense, but we both know Rutger has to shoot you with tranks to get you to dress up. Yeah, like in the A-team, she said, pausing to do a little pirouette in the steel-toed boots she wore in her lab. I bought this in Venice. We were coming back from the conference center, and it was just so pretty, and there was only one left. My god, you're finally becoming a real girl. Don't be so gender essentialist, Nicholas, she sniffed. Anyway, I was trying it on between two mirrors, and something just kind of, it was like, you remember that reactor I worked on a while ago? The one you were working on when you were ten? That's more than a while ago. You know what I mean, she said, speeding up to a trot. Listen, I was looking down at the sequins, and I just kind of, I don't know, I'd had a lot of coffee, and it seemed like they were sort of moving. Do you mind my asking if you slept last night? No, but listen, listen, moving in a pattern, something I knew, or I knew the start, but not the end, I'd seen the start on the plane, like when you're at karaoke and you realize halfway through the opening that you don't know the verses, but just the chorus, but when the words come up, you realize you do know the verses after all. So I ran to write it down, and it seemed okay. I mean, it seemed like it should work, if you look at the sequence as electrons. Anyway, I started the same as the old one, but this time I created the graphene substrate by making kind of a carbon snow. Is one of its side effects not needing to breathe? And it works! I switched the house grid off the solar cells and onto the reactor, and I'm sorry about the heat uh, and the smell. I think that's mostly burning dust and bugs on the halogens. I keep meaning to switch them to the LEDs, but there's never time. She trailed off. Her face was slick and hectic, red dots below her eyes, hair not just damp, but actually dripping down her neck into her dress, turning the white to gray. Okay, I said. I'll come look, but then we're sticking a cold washcloth on you. <laughs> <laughs> I remember reading that, and I love that scene so much. <laughs> like, <Yay. laughs> um... Okay, so first question. Um, so both, like, like obviously with Nick in in Beneath the Rising, and and I, I got a sense from the description for um, these lifeless these lifeless things, which is your new novella, which is out now, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, it came out on the fifth. Nice. Um, so both of them seem to incorporate the, this idea of you know these main characters who don't really know everything that's going on, or at least not as much as, as some of the other characters that are around them, um, as these bizarre and terrible things are, are happening. Um, and so I'm curious, and I think it's more of a, uh, like a drafting question, but how do you walk the line between keeping things unclear um, while still giving the reader enough to stay engaged and, and revealing things as you go? That is a super good question. Um, I, I guess it, it does come down to kind of, do you trust the reader or not? Mm -hmm. I know when there's books that feel a little too easy to me, or it feels like I'm being spoon fed information, or, or you know, someone appears at just the right time and is like, you know, look, I found the killer's wallet on the sidewalk. I don't like when books um, f feel too slick and easy like that. I, I think a any fiction in any genre should push you a little bit to be an active participant in the book. And, and my favorite books are where I'm figuring things out on my own, maybe not necessarily at the same rate as the author or as the characters, but some of the characters. And I, I like for there to be not just what happens next as the question that pulls me on in a book, but, um, you know, what does it mean? Uh, who is this person? What is the significance of what I've just been told. And mm -hmm. I think the the constant influx of questions, answers, questions, answers that don't really quite match up is my favorite thing in books. And I'm always trying to recreate it in my stuff. And I don't know if I succeed, but uh, go team. <laughs> I would say you do. Um, <laughs> I know, cause, cause, like Beneath the Rising especially, I think does that really, really well. So that's why I wanted to, I was, I was curious about your process there. Um, so you, uh, you're out in, I was gonna say the East Coast, you're out West uh, from Relative to Us. Edmonton, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, how does, um, you know, your life in Edmonton or, or Alberta generally, um, does that feed into your writing at all? Does that influence what you write about? And if so, how? Uh, well, it definitely gives you the ability to write really, really cold temperatures very well. <laughs> uh, I know the exact temperature at which the oil in a car stored outside will turn into chocolate pudding. 
we just got out of the polar vortex in which it almost hit minus 50 a couple of days. I heard. Oh, that was that was good times. That was good times. But um, aside from the settings thing, I, I think it also gives me kind of two things in my writing. And the first is the ability to look at Edmonton as kind of this, uh, for, for instance, Beneath the Rising is set in Edmonton. The scene I just read was set in St. Albert, where I grew up. Mm. And um, it gives you the ability, I think, to look at Edmonton as kind of a little island in in the greater province of Alberta, which uh, I don't want to say it's having some issues like our neighbors down south, but it is being run by people who think that the people who were just running things down south had some good ideas. And that's not really good for a lot of us in marginalized populations, people with disabilities, people below the poverty line, seniors, parents, uh, most of the population, actually. So there's that. And, mm -hmm. you know, the, the perspective that we're kind of, we almost feel a lot of the time, like we're on our own here. And of course, it's not a paradise. There's a lot of bigotry and racism and uh, stuff to, to consider, I think, that makes us more like the States than less. But also, I think the other thing, and I was thinking about this a couple of years ago when I was in Dublin for Worldcon. I did a tour up to the Whitlow Mountains, uh, sorry, hills. And those of us who live near the Rockies don't really think of them as mountains. Sorry, Whitlow Mountains. Uh, the tour guide was telling us that um, we seem to be in the middle of nowhere, but of course we're still on a paved road. There's a bridge you can see behind yourself. You can walk for no more than 15 minutes in any direction without seeing something that a person has built as a permanent structure that's been left there, um, a cairn or a collapsed castle or a sign or something. And I keep thinking that is one of the big differences to me between the quote old world and the new world. And I think that feeds into my writing a lot. Um, obviously there's been human habitation in North America for thousands of years, but indigenous people walk a lot more lightly on the landscape. They don't want or need to leave permanent markers. But in you know Europe, in the UK, there's nowhere you can go and get lost. There's always somewhere that people have been before and have modified the landscape and have left marks of human activity. Here, if I drove a friend 15 minutes outside of city limits and dropped them off, they would be lost, gone, possibly eaten by something. And that sense of space, uh, danger, uncertainty, um, of us feeling small and, and lost and hopefully knowing our proper place in, in the food chain is something I think that uh, Canadians in particular always kind of have at the back of our minds. Like this is not a densely developed place still. There's still a lot of unknown. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, so if anyone from Whitlow is watching, um, and you can send your angry letters too. <laughs> <laughs> it was a really good tour. You have very nice hills. <laughs> oh man i said i i love doing the like these sorts of discussions because inevitably i end up i'm sitting here and i'm like okay i want to ask this follow-up question this follow-up question this follow-up question to like everything like things that all four of you have said um which is which is great but also a problem because we only have so much time um so I, all all of that was amazing um i want to throw a couple of general questions at at the entire group i'm gonna i'm gonna skip the first one that i sent you ahead of time about defining Canadian fiction. Um, and uh, I think we've kind of covered that. So um, I'm going to start, I, we'll go in reverse order for this first question. So I'm going to start with Creamy. Um, so first general question I want to throw at you is, do you think, um, and I think and Sarah commented on this a little bit already, um, do you think Canadian authors um, and publishers are doing enough to stand out um, in, and I, I said before, in a market that's dominated by the United States, but just in, in the market generally, um, and if not, um, what else could we do? What more could we do? What could we do differently? Like, like how do we start to change that? Um, and so I'll start with premium and I'll work my way uh, back around. Uh, this is good because I have to leave in a couple of minutes. Sorry. Okay. Because no uh, I, I have a meeting in 10 minutes. Um, and that is a good question, though, because I'm not sure. Um, I, a Canadian, have an American literary agent and um, my publisher for Beneath the Rising is English. So we have a lot of time zones. And so I, I don't know what Canadian publishers could be doing to stand out in a market that's dominated by the States. Although I may find out later this year because I do have a book coming out from ECW Press, which is mm -hmm. headed in the Toronto, uh, along with all the other books that are coming out this year. But I think 
the issue with that question is a are authors doing enough i don't know what authors can be expected to do aside from provide the book but it's mm -hmm. becoming clear that we have to be more and more of our own marketing department and publicity but my impression though is that canadian publishers are very focused on marketing kind of within canada a and b very much within sort of the traditional media so they're the ones who are literally yeah at, at festivals at readings um they want to do radio spots newspapers magazines and it's I feel like American and British publishers are trying to go more um, non-traditional, focus more on social media, less on traditional uh, media, and they're putting 90% of their effort into, um, you know, virtual spaces. And to me, it feels like Canadian media still sort of hasn't pivoted. And mm. the, the goal would be, you know, Oh, I hope somebody talks about my book on CBC, whereas the rest of, you know, the world, American publishers, English publishers would be like, why would you care if you got your book on the radio? <laughs> that kind of thing. So I think it's maybe just that, you know, for, for CanCon purposes, we're a little bit behind possibly on the marketing curve. Yeah, no, I hear that. Um, before I get anybody else, Premi, I know you said you had to duck out quickly. So did you have to go now? Do you want to say Pharrell now before I go to anybody uh, I else? I can speak or... about three more minutes. <laughs> okay, perfect. It's okay. If you have to duck out, let me know. Uh, yeah. Jen, I'll go to you next. Uh, yeah, so I think that the whole concept of marketing in general, of getting our books and our work and um, ourselves known out there, is such a daunting concept, especially for debut novelists, which is where I'm at right now. Uh, so I've taken a kind of a different approach at the moment by not trying not to think about it in the general sense, but by going really small by focusing on just where I can make some connections with readers. So, you know, chatting with my students about not just my writing, but but writing in general. Uh, events like this, um, just, just trying to reach out, you know, with a small blog um, and maybe from there. And I'm trying to just keep in mind that, okay, whatever that big market should or shouldn't look like, maybe that is or isn't going to be for me. Maybe it is or isn't going to be for some of you or other writers out there. So I'm really just trying to focus instead on of what does that market look like for writers? Uh, how can I, as a debut novelist, how can I, as a writer, uh, just start making connections with readers? That's just what I'm hoping for. Awesome. Thanks. Sarah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, again, I'm always kind of thinking about this, um, the way in which we frame questions of Canadian literature and what we need to do um, as, po you know, in relation to the United States, because I know like our proximity to the United States always allows it, it sometimes feels like we're being papered over in a way. And, um, but perhaps we just feel that way. And so when we're marketing and, and when we're thinking about, you know, how can we create like a Canadian literature that's apart from America and stuff like that, it feels a lot like a nation building and, and a canon building project to me in which there then becomes, you know, this need to, you know, be the David versus the Goliath of America by creating and doubling down on these um, systems, these apparatuses that are already there within Canada that actually I think need to be exploited, that need to be, um, you know, disassembled, that need to be challenged. You know, we, we don't need to constantly think about, you know, Canada, you know, how can we create a Canada, a Canadian literature and a Canadian, um, you know, a Canadian um, canon, a Canadian uh, industry that is different from America. We we need to reframe that in terms of thinking, how can we, you know, uplift all those various communities with, you know, within our society, within our society, how do we deal with our, basically, how do we deal with our own stuff, you know, <laughs> I'm saying stuff as opposed to the other word, how do we deal with, you know, our internal issues? You know, not because of what America is doing and how America does things and America is dominating the market. How do we deal with our own issues? How do we create non-traditional structures that might allow for, you know, marginalized voices, marginalized Canadian voices that aren't usually, you know, allowed into the canon or that aren't supported by those traditional structures that don't get, you know, um, um, 
featured on CBC because they don't fit a certain kind of box of of what you should be writing mm -hmm. um, in a, in a, and how you should be writing it in a way that will get you on those lists. So, I mean, when we, you know, when um, we talked earlier about uh, social media and things like that, I'm also thinking about, you know, self-publishing and self-publishing mm -hmm. authors and how do we support those authors? Um, and, and how do we encourage authors of color to write in books that uh, write in genres that's not just, you know, literary memoir and stuff like that, which can be a bit difficult. So, um, you know, I'm not too concerned with America dominating. I'm more concerned because I think that's going to happen regardless, but I think that we need to you know, provide more resources, more non-traditional resources to get marginalized authors within Canada to have their voices heard, to have that be sort of rise to the top of what Canadian literature is and can be and provide that support. That's awesome. Yeah, I love that. Um, Premi, I want to be conscious of your time. Do you need to duck out or? Yes, yeah, sorry, I do have to bail, okay. bail. but yeah. thank you guys all so much and thank you for the invite. <laughs> no, thank you. This, this I look great. forward to, uh, to seeing the, uh, the recording later. Yeah, I'll let you know when it's out. <laughs> awesome. Right. Thank you so much, Premi. Thanks, guys. Bye. Um, all right, so then, yeah, so I, I will go to Lex for uh, the question. Wow. Um, Sarah covered so much, and it's sort of <laughs> this exciting vision of, of what what the arts could maybe be in Canada that we've we've never kind of realized. It's sort of daunting to even think about the how. Um, mm -hmm. But um, Premier was talking about being at Worldcon in, in uh, Dublin. And a couple of years ago, I was at the Worldcon in Finland. Um, and I noticed that because it is a, a country that is very geographically small compared to Canada, there... Uh, visual arts community is vastly more well connected with each other. Mm. Um, that the physical distances between our big cities and our communities is one of the challenges we kind of face because they're really anyone is within a couple hours train ride of anyone else and they all get together as a community and they they have this opportunity to study together and work together uh, face to face until recently um, that I hadn't really considered the scale of how, how distance plays into that. Um, and when I was young, I didn't really even have any awareness that there was a Canadian publishing industry. I never aspired to be involved in it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, in the context of this conversation, I can say, oh, that's, that was clearly a failure of people in the the publishing community that that was the case I, my only experiences with canadian literature were pretty much class assignments um but it, it feels very intractable in some ways when you are a country that is is the ideal ideal sized population for product testing of american products right like if, if someone in the U.S. wants to launch a new salad dressing, they put it in Canadian grocery stores. Um, and so, of course, our focus is drawn there and, and pulling it inward is, is such an interesting exercise. Um, and on top of that, I, a lot of my focus as writers has been trying to reach queer readers. Mm. Um, so I, I have been less nationally focused and more sort of focused on the community in which, in which I live. Um, and, and that has all of these same divisions. They, you know, lit versus science fiction was sort of a challenge for getting into queer bookstores. And then the US Canadian thing was sort of mm -hmm. that second layer of removal. So I, that is not an answer. It's a, oh, look at the scope of the problem. <laughs> we had such good answers that I feel like I have comparatively little to add to them. So <laughs> no, that's what I have. Okay. No, I thought that was great because you're right. Like there are, there are so many other kind of layers and, and divergences and differences that we have to deal with as authors. And, and, mm -hmm. and so I, I, that, was, that was awesome. I, no, I, I totally hear what you're saying. Um, last question I want to throw at you, because uh, I'm conscious of everyone's time. 
um, is uh, if you give me one recommendation um, of a Canadian author, um, ideally someone who has had you know new work out within the last year, because I know it's been a tough year for um, for authors and publishers, and especially debut authors and people with new releases. Um, so yeah, so one recommendation of a Canadian author that uh, our viewers and, and students um, should go read uh, from any genre, and I will start with Jen. All right, so being the rebel of the group here, um, there, there are great authors, but like Canadian authors, absolutely, in YA, and I know it's re-Canadian, but there's a book called We Hunt the Flame, Hafsa Faisal, who, it, and it's fantastic. She's, uh, she's a woman of color, and um, she's, um, I've, I've interacted with her, so I just, I just wanted to, a shout out for her book, We Hunt the Flame, um, because it adds so much to the conversation about diversity that we're having around now. So I realize it's not Canadian, but still go read it. I will absolve you. It's all good. <laughs> oh, Lex, go ahead. Oh, that was a reaction to the abs absolution. Uh, <laughs> Ada Hoffman has a poetry collection that's out any minute now uh, called Million Year Elegies. Mm -hmm. And um, I think some versions are actually out in the like electronic bookstores, but the, the print version will be available soon. And their book, The Fallen, is going to be out this summer. Oh, yes, I heard about that. Yeah. Yeah. Ada's work. Yeah. Their work is awesome. Yeah. No, highly, highly recommend. Uh, Sarah. Uh, Louisa Onome as somebody that I kind of interact with on Twitter and, and uh, Black Canadian author. She's got a book coming out called Like Home. I think it should be coming out. Um, either this week or next week. So I'm really excited for her. And it, it deals with, um, you know, uh, gentrification and, and what happens in poor communities and things like that. And uh, I got to read, I got to read like a, an, an ARC. Is it ARC or ARC? I never uh, knew. Either. I never heard both. <laughs> I, okay. I, got, I got to read like uh, an early version of it and it's great. So look out for it. Awesome. Um, and I'll throw one in there as well, um, which is uh, The Unbroken by C.L. Clark, uh, which is uh, epic fantasy, uh, North African inspired. Um, uh, C.L. Clark is also one of the editors for Podcastle and, and you know, their, their short fiction is amazing. Um, and I think it comes out end of March, I believe. Um, but I, I also I happen to get an arc of it or ARC, whatever it is. Um, and yeah, just loved it. I absolutely devoured that book. So highly, highly recommend it. Um, okay, last thing, uh, where can people find your work? Where can they find you online out there in the world um, if they want to check out your work, which I highly, highly recommend they do. I'll go Sarah first. Uh, SarahRaleigh.com and you'll find all of my books and uh, other stuff that I'm working on. So that's a S S A R A H R A U G L E Y dot com. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, Jen. Uh, JenBraxma.com. That's my book coaching website. I'm still working on an author website, but it's all the information. If you go to JenBraxma.com, will eventually lead you to more information about my book and writings and everything else. Perfect. And Lex? Um, probably a good entry point for me is Twitter. So it's LX Beckett, Beckett with two Ts. And uh, that will lead you to my site, my other site, my Instagram, all of the things. Um, but my books are in, in all the bookstores too. So you just order. Awesome. Um, and then, yeah, because uh, Premi unfortunately had to duck it a little early, but um, her Twitter is Premisaurus, uh, P-R-E-M-E-E, -E, and then Saurus, like the dinosaurs. Um, and uh, a lot of her work is on there and also premiemohammed.com just to give her a little, a little shout out. Um, so I'm going to call it there. I just want to say thanks uh, to all of you and, and to Premi as well for, for joining us. That was awesome. And like, like I said, there was a bunch of follow-up questions I could have asked and, and discussed this further, but none of us can be here for hours. Um, yeah, so thank you to all of you. Thank you to those of you who are watching. Um, go read something Canadian, get it from your library, buy it if you can. Uh, even just signal boosting is good um, so we can get more Canadian authors' um, attention and get their works out there. So I'll just